good evening and welcome to Garden Line. And can we have a sound check here? Anybody give Rhoda, me I can up? I can hear you just fine. Okay. Oh, yeah. I think it was just the <laughs> sound. Just the introduction. The, yeah. All right. Great. All right. Uh, <laughs> welcome everyone. Uh, and glad that you are all with us tonight. Uh, this is brought to you each week by SDSU Extension to answer your garden questions and inform you about some of the things that are going on. Uh, tonight we have as our panelists, uh, John Ball. Uh, and John, I don't have my cheat sheet in front of me, so I'll let you give your title. <laughs> All right, well, uh, thank you, Rhoda, and thank you everyone for participating tonight. No, I'm not sitting in my kitchen. I'm in an extension <laughs> office in an undisclosed location uh, tonight in my usual travels. But tonight, you know, I'm gonna talk to you, wow, the temperature's gotten warm, things are heating up, but now we got a lot of things that are going bump in the night. So we're gonna talk about scales and other sucking critters. <laughs> And uh, Amanda Bachman, our extension field entomologist, uh, IPM coordinator. No, you, that's not me. <laughs> I'll let you. <laughs> yeah, like, I, I have a very long job title, but IPM coordinator is actually not one of the things one that I've anymore. ever officially had to do. <laughs> I am the pesticide education and urban entomology field specialist here in Peer. And tonight I'm actually, I did do some field entomology over the past couple of days. So I will be showing some pictures of what we found out in the Badlands on a teacher professional development and just, you know, some, some cool insect photos. Uh, from the past couple of weeks since I've been on the road. Thank you. And we're fortunate tonight to have with us Laura Edwards, our SDSU climatologist. And I think I have that correct. <laughs> yep, I'm the state climatologist with Extension. And I'll give a little climate update, kind of review of the last month since I visited with you last. And I'll look ahead towards July and the rest of the summer. Sounds great. Oh. John, you want to? Oh, and I'm Rhoda Burroughs, uh, SDSU uh, Extension Horticulturist, and I'm going to be talking some tonight about oh, a whole range of things from, from weeds to currants to uh, what we want to be planting now. So, uh, John, you want to take it away? I'll give it a try here. Let's see. Share. All right, everyone. Well, um, thank you for participating tonight. And again, I'm always going to go over a little bit of the growing degree days base 50. And wow, did we jump, you know, if this were a race, Laura, you know, we should have it like a horse race, see who's leading, who's following on that. But what I've been surprised at, and maybe you'll chat about it, is Aberdeen was the tundra of the north. And Rapid City actually was the farthest ahead early on in, on in the year. And now Aberdeen's caught up. And I don't know if they caught up or Rapid City slowed down, but they're almost about the same in terms of growing degree days. And Sioux Falls, yep, we're really getting into summer now. We're at uh, 938 as of yesterday evening. Of course, everybody knows it's been darn warm across state. And that really helped drive this the catelpas are in bloom right now, as well as the Japanese tree lilacs. And again, as with insects, trees flowering is temperature dependent. When you accumulate enough heat, they will bloom and fruit, by the way. And of course, different insects will appear. So we're kind of getting into that mid-season part, but the catelpas are just absolutely gorgeous. I was in uh, uh, here on this last weekend at the garden party over there and uh, wow the catelpas in their park were just spectacular now I love catelpas it's my wife's favorite tree and uh, you know what they're to me they're a wonderful tree but I know people don't like them because they drop things all the time they're going to drop these flowers they're going to drop big leaves they're going to drop those long beans but uh, boy right now you just cannot beat them and um, a little bit on emerald ash borer. Uh, again, very little. I've talked about it enough, but just a reminder, this is going to be a scene across the state of South Dakota over about the next 20 years. 
where you're looking at streets where almost every tree is an ash and almost every tree is infested or now dead from the infestation of emerald ash borer. And uh, obviously this is gonna be tremendous cost to communities to go out there and take all these trees down. And as I mentioned last time, emerald ash borer started flying about a week or two ago. There's one on my hand. Uh, so you get an idea of the size. They're pretty darn small, you know, about a half an inch. And they aren't so patient to sit there like that one. That one was sitting in a little bit of alcohol for a day, and that kind of slowed him down quite a bit. So he would be patient and sit there, and he's going to sit there forever because he's dead. But um, again, they're very bright. You probably won't see them just because they're flying usually above our heads. Uh, if you find them at about uh, your height, that means that tree's probably pretty much near dead. But the thing I want to show you is this. Look at that. See a little piece of wood there? We've been doing studies uh, trying to collect uh, things that eat emerald ash borer. There's a lot of parasitoids that'll feed on them. And so we have samples. That is just a little log. I mean, you can get an idea of the size. It's only a couple inches in diameter. It's only about nine inches long. Um, I collected nine adults out of that, nine adults. Uh, now, imagine if somebody leaves Sioux Falls or Canton or one of the other communities in Lincoln or Minnehaha County and just happens to carry a piece that small. Oh, what problem could that be? I'll take it out to my cabin in the Black Hills and I'll burn it right away. And you forget about it because it's a little piece of wood mixed in with a lot of other pieces of wood. Well, you just moved an infestation. And so just a reminder to everyone that you can't move any hardwood firewood, any hardwood firewood out of the quarantine area, which is Lincoln, Minnehaha, and Turner County. And you cannot move raw ash by that. Uh, raw boards that were cut, uh, pieces of wood. Now, if you got a bedroom set made out of ash, that's absolutely fine. But we're trying to slow the infestation. It's going to move eventually. People are going to move small pieces. Somebody's just not going to get the word or not care. But the longer we can delay this, more other communities can prepare for it. So again, be aware, let's not move the wood. Well, in the other end, update, we're still going to talk about winter kill. Probably my last time to talk about winter kill. And it's really a spring kill. Maybe Laura will talk about this. But, you know, we had that really warm period at the end of April, 90. And then it dropped at 20 something. And it's not so much our winters that kill woody plants. It's our springs and falls because of those tr extreme temperature fluctuations. We had a number of plants that were very late in leafing out. And we've got some that are stone cold dead. A lot of sugar maples uh, just are brown like this one. They just started, that's it. They're black on the inside now. They are not leafing out. And same with honey locusts, though again, these seem to be cultivar related. Skyline and Sunburst are two that I noted uh, have not broken bud in many areas. Uh, again, they, they kind of come out of dormancy a little earlier than some others such as Northern Acclaim. And that might explain why we see more damage on them than others. And I'm not saying that every, every Skyline and Sunburst in the state is dead, but it's just kind of interesting that those cultivars seem to be a little bit more commonly affected, where the Northern Acclaim, which was uh, produced out of, out of North Dakota, seems to have tolerated those temperature fluctuations rather well because they experience them in North Dakota as well. Well, look at this, our little jiffy pop scale, as I call it. Uh, look at that. This is the cottony maple scale. And right now that ovasac, as we call it among entomologists, that big puffy ball of lots and lots and lots, I mean, literally hundreds of eggs is kind of expanding out beneath the dead mom. And they're hatching here pretty quick and they're going to scurry out on the leaves for the summer, sucking sap out of the tree. And then it'll move back and form this, uh, uh, this sedentary state, the original couch potatoes or tree potatoes might be a better term, and complete their life. Now, these produce honeydew, a very sticky substance. And so a lot of people notice that everything's tacky beneath the tree before they'll notice the insects. But it's kind of interesting. There is a couple of little leaf lindens near me, and two remain unaffected. And one is just covered with this. Um, so again, they can be very attuned to their hosts. 
there are a number of effective treatments, uh, but I would like to remind people a lot of the systemic treatments that could be used, you gotta be very cautious. Because if you have a lind injury, you do not wanna be using this. If I suggested you did, um, Amanda would come down the hall and probably beat me and, and rightfully so, because we don't wanna kill pollinators. Oh, and this one, I love it. I've been getting pictures of this in the last week. You know, what's all these little bumps on my, on my silver maple? Uh, this is the maple bladder gall caused by the maple bladder gall mite. And those little galls are caused by the mite from the underside and it causes the plant to form this tissue. So it's plant tissue you're looking at. And a little mite lives inside there and kind of eats. Um, and these will turn color during the season, pink to red, to black and they all don't color at once. They're kind of pretty in an odd sort of way. They do not harm the plant at all. Zero zip, nada. So um, notice them, but don't worry about them. They're, they're not really going to hurt anything. Oh, and look at this. Uh, I think Rhoda's gonna talk about some other things that they eat. And yes, we all love yummy plums, but look at the picture I got. Those are not yummy plums. Uh, that's plum pockets. What happens is there's a fungal disease that uh, can affect the fruit, can affect the foliage too, but affects the fruit. And what happens is that large seed from a stone fruit doesn't develop, nor does the flush develop. And rather than this thin, crisp skin, you got this real spongy layer. So when you pop those open, kind of like hot pockets, but these are plum pockets, you'll notice that it's completely hollow and, and certainly is not edible. Uh, this happens mostly with our wild plums as well as some of our American plums. Our European Japanese tend not to be affected by this, but for people trying to maintain the native uh, uh, American plums in that, they'll sometimes spot this as this person did who sent the pictures. One of the best things you can do is pick up all the fruit and get rid of it. Nobody's going to eat it anyway. There are sprays that can be done in the spring, but uh, in my experience, trying to time them, which is a single application of like Bordeaux mix, uh, copper sulfate, uh, done just at bud break is awfully hard to do. And, and frankly, I haven't had much success with it. Rhoda may, uh, uh, may add to that as well, but we're seeing this popping up now. And then finally, something to munch on, mulberries are ripening and they, and they don't ripen all at once. And they kind of have different colors too, because we have the white mulberries here, which can be white, can be black, can be a little bit red. They're not the red mulberries that occur down south. Uh, one of our summer interns was used to the red mulberries, which are tasty when you pull them off plants and was rather horrified when he bit into one of these. Occasionally find a white mulberry plant, uh, the uh, uh, Morris Alba, which is from Russia and we grow it here because it's pretty tough, that actually has sweet fruit. Some of it tastes like cotton balls. Boy, doesn't that sound tasty. It just sucks the moisture out of your mouth. Uh, birds seem to like them. They don't have much of a taste bud apparently, uh, but uh, they don't like them more than everything else in your garden. I've sometimes seen these sold as if you plant these, the birds will go to these and ignore your garden. Nah, uh, they like your garden still. So if you want to try one of these, go ahead. Again, don't make your decisions on what to eat based on a single picture. Make sure someone tells you, yes, that is a white mulberry. Go ahead and bite into one. Uh, but if you're expecting a raspberry or a blackberry-like flavor, you're probably going to be pretty disappointed and quickly grab a Snickers bar. So with that, I'm uh, finished and I'll turn it back over to you, Rhoda. All right. We have a question for you, John, in the chat. Oh, sure. Uh, I'm helping maintain garden plots at the Nordby 4-H building on the state uh, fairgrounds. Okay. There's a shrub small tree. I think maybe high bush cranberry appears to be leggy and perhaps could use pruning. Would you be traveling to Huron again to provide some advice to me on when to prune and best pruning practices? Oh, absolutely. More than happy to do that. And uh, I was just there Saturday 
and I was there last Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Uh, and I was there the week before, and I'll be coming out again to do some tree trimming out there. So we'll have plenty of opportunities because you're not going to touch it now until <laughs> next spring. So we got plenty of time to meet up, but uh, we'll try to do it sometime uh, in July here when I'm out there. And we have a second question just came in. Is it possible for the roots of a Norway spruce to grow underneath the concrete floor of a basement? Or do they tend to have more shallow roots? Yeah, they tend to be more shallow. I mean, everyone, everyone that's witnessed the spruces that have flipped over uh, during that storm certainly see how shallow the root system is. But you'll notice I kind of put a hedge to this answer. And, and my reasoning for that is, the reason they're shallow is they need oxygen. And oxygen is most abundant near the soil surface. I mean, oddly enough, roots have to breathe. Um, and so, you know, as long as there's air, they will grow. Well, when you dig a foundation, you've loosened soil. And so sometimes we'll find that they'll follow those kind of cracks going down and can actually end up 12 feet down because they're following that column of loosened soil that now allows oxygen to penetrate. So I will say it's unlikely, but I will not say that it's impossible. Uh, I've seen that sort of thing happen. The biggest thing is how far away is the basement from the spruce tree? If it's more than 30 feet, I would say no. If it's within 20 feet, again, there is that possibility. I believe a question came in earlier, and maybe this is the same one that was 10 foot from the building, and they were concerned about whether it would unsettle the foundation. Ooh, now that's a whole different question. That's an <laughs> interesting question. And the Germans have looked at that, uh, and they give it a long word, if anyone that translates from German. Uh, but what they found is it's not so much the roots it's on heavy clay soils, which essentially is South Dakota. The fact that they're absorbing moisture tends to be the problem. And so, yes, uh, big trees, roots can cause issues with buildings, both from the root pressure itself and the fact that they're absorbing a tremendous amount of moisture next to the uh, building or can be. And that can cause some issues as well. So I'm not suggesting remove the tree. You might want to follow up, send me some pictures, and it might be something I'm coming by. Again, I'd hate to see a tree taken out just because of a possibility. Uh, but on the other hand, you'd hate to find that as a problem 20 years from now and wish you had removed the tree. So I will say that that is a possibility. If it was several large trees, it would be a definite possibility that it could affect the building foundation. All right, John, now you're making me nervous about my silver maples in my backyard. <laughs> you should always be nervous about <laughs> silver maples. All right, but I will give you one bit of advice on silver maples. Silver maples tend to cause more of your neighbor's problems than your problems. They tend to fall on neighbor's houses, the root surface in neighbor's yard. They seem to know behave at home. <laughs> <laughs> well, mine have found my compost pile and are <laughs> growing up through it. <laughs> Well, let's turn our attention to some more of the creepy crawlies, Amanda. Sure, I'll do a quick update and then we can probably throw it to Laura because I'm guessing people are going to have a lot of weather questions this week as it's been pretty active. And we're swapping. All right, I was in a land without trees. There we go. I went down to the Badlands uh, yesterday actually to do some teacher professional develop development with the South Dakota Discovery Center. So I taught them how to use nets, kind of the crash course in insect collecting. And we just kind of took a look around next to the Sage Creek campground to see what we could see. So for folks who maybe haven't been through the Badlands recently, or if ever, Sage Creek is on the western end, about 11 miles, 11 to 15-ish miles south of Wall. The bison do hang out on that side of the park, so you'd want to definitely watch out for those. And then there are also a lot of prairie dogs, which it turns out they are going to be doing some trapping for so that they can medicate them for fleas 
because the fleas on prairie dogs can transmit things like the sylvatic plague. So this is why, for many reasons, you don't want to feed the wildlife. But we had lovely weather after the storm blew through and uh, they caught a lot of grasshoppers. So I feel like we're, we're going to have another maybe banner grasshopper year uh, in certain parts of the state. We had everything from the very first instar, so the very sort of first life stage, to adults of some species. And everything was still actually pretty green out there. Most of the herbivory damage was actually from the prairie dogs kind of clipping the grass around their towns. Um, but grasshoppers, as you know, the grasslands, road ditches, as those things dry down, grasshoppers are sort of notorious for moving to whatever else is green, which can be your gardens and things that you want. So if you're in places that are sort of known grasshopper hangouts, you know, do keep an eye on your populations and do keep an eye on what size of grasshoppers you're seeing. They are easier to manage when they are smaller as they get larger, you're not really going to kill them with anything except for maybe chickens or guinea fowl. Um, they will be more of sort of an edge pest if you've got a large garden plot. So you can do some like border management. Um, but the thing with grasshoppers is they're fairly resilient. They're going to keep moving in from elsewhere. And a lot of the products that are going to manage them are also going to be detrimental to pollinators, which you need in order to actually, you know, get some of your vegetables um, to produce in the garden. So it's one of the things that you want to keep an eye out so that you're ready um, and so that you're not surprised. Um, but just we've gotten some nice moisture here in like the pier area. So things are still pretty lush um, and the grasshoppers are doing just fine, like out in the wild and not in yards. Um, we had some other like cool little bugs in there, but the grasshoppers were definitely the easiest to catch. And then uh, speaking of bees, you know, out in the wild, our um, cactus are blooming and we had some, you know, cute little bees that were just hanging out in the flowers um, sort of this morning as they were waking up. Um, so just remember that, you know, we have more bees out there than just our bumblebees and our honeybees. So you, you know, go out, take a look at the flowers, take a look at your garden and just kind of see what's flying around. Um, if you do need to use an insecticide in your garden, uh, make sure to read and follow those label directions. And also, um, if you can apply when things are not blooming or when bees are not active, uh, that will help to reduce the impact on those non-target organisms. So short update this week, uh, the June bugs are definitely flying around. I had a couple like fly into my head at the uh, Sage Creek campground. So again, they're not very uh, graceful. I know I've got a question that came in through Ask an Expert um, asking about grub control in lawns. So maybe I'll plan to talk about that next week as we're still a little bit away from the ideal time to do those treatments, but in a couple of weeks it will be time. So if you've got questions about grubs and that kind of thing, keep an eye out for future installments of Garden Hour. And with that, I can see if there's we don't have any questions. Oh, let's see in the chat. Oh, biting flies. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Looks like we have two questions in the chat. So box elder bugs. Um, box elder bugs are, you can just ignore them. Um, they don't do anything of like human, you know, health concern. They're not actually really even a pest. Pretty much their biggest sin is that they'll move in as adults to overwinter, but they're not something that causes economic damage. They're, they're not something that needs to be controlled at all. My recommendation with box elder bugs is to just get cool with them. Your life will be easier, um, <laughs> which is probably not the answer you wanted, but we have them in great numbers here in Pier as well. They just tend to do really well in certain areas. They don't need box elder maples to survive, but they do enjoy them. Um, and they sort of, once they start breeding, they will have sort of like, you know, just nymphs sort of all summer. And some of those, you know, if they're adults at the right time are the ones that are gonna survive the winter. But um, they're just one of those bugs that can be out there in large numbers, but they don't do anything bad to people. Uh, biting flies are apparently out in the Aberdeen area. I'm sorry, Aberdeen, you were built on a swamp. With that <laughs> comes some critters that enjoy feeding on people. Uh, we are rapidly approaching West Nile virus season. Um, it's actually here. I'm sure we've probably had our first infections. They just maybe haven't been clocked by doctors yet. Um, biting flies, 
do not vector that. That's just some species of mosquitoes. Um, but biting flies are mm, sometimes slightly deterred by deep-based repellents, but really your best defense against those is going to be physical. So wearing a long sleeve shirt, making sure that your skin is covered um, because they're just they're just ruthless. Um, and flies have like little knives as mouth parts, the ones that bite people and other mammals. So they slice you and then lap up your blood. Um, it's not like a mosquito that is actually piercing your skin with a needle like mouth part and actually having the decency to, you know, give a little bit of anesthetic with that bite so you don't feel it. Um, but, you know, wear your personal repellent that's going to protect you against more than just mosquitoes. Um, also, you know, ticks. And then, you know, Wearing the long shirt, the long sleeves, um, long pants, that's going to be one of your best things. And then if you can, timing your activity. I know, you know, after work, we tend to be outside when it's still, you know, light out, which right now is really late in Pierre, South Dakota. Um, and as you approach those dusk hours, some of those biting insects are also going to be more active. Um, question about after receiving golf balls have tail, you now have flea beetles. Um, so. Flea beetles are, can we actually have an article um, on the extension website that we just updated on flea beetles. I will throw that in the chat unless um, Evan finds it first. Um, but you can sometimes do a trap crop for flea beetles and also depending on what they're after, um, your plants may be able to kind of grow out of their damage. They, they are foliar feeders and they'll give sort of little tiny holes because they are a very small beetle. So, um, they're not particularly related to like hail or anything. Um, I feel like that the damage may have just sort of coincided there, but we do have some resources up on flea beetle management. Um, I see the tip about fresh rosemary on your skin. I will reiterate that please use repellents that have been uh, tested and verified by the EPA. Um, there are a lot of home remedies out there and for things that vector diseases to humans, I really, 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 really want people to be wearing things that have been uh, have been evaluated and have been shown to repel insects for uh, certain amounts of time. Um, and we've got the flea beetle um, articles are in the chat. So for folks who had those questions, please check those out. Um, Let's see, a uh, bronze colored beetle on your potato plant. It could be Colorado potato beetle, but I would love it if you could email me a picture of those um, so that I can, con can confirm. Um, they're not super bronzish, but they are kind of a reddish color when they're larva. Um, so that's one that having a sample would be great. Um, same thing with spittle bugs on your obedient plant. You may just have to deal with them. Um, like just, just let them live. Um, they're probably not going to take the, take the plant down or anything. It's a little sort of like leaf hopper type thing that's feeding on the um, plant sap. So really it's protected by that bubble enclosure that it made for itself. And you're, it's overkill to try to hit that with a systemic insecticide, like just allow the spittle bugs to enjoy their lives. Um, let's see. Okay. Uh, is it true that eating garlic and onions helps repel, <laughs> repel flying biters? Again, please use your EPA labeled um, personal insect repellents for these kinds of things. Um, <laughs> they've done lots of research. The labels are extensive. They've got great graphics now telling you exactly what they repel and for how long and your reapplication instructions. Um, there's also sort of a tool on the website that you can use to be like, okay, this is what I'm trying to repel for how long, and it will give you some like list of suggested products. So I will try to get that into the chat here as well when I'm not talking, but I am the approximate last person that will be uh, supporting any of the uh, social media, you know, pesticide repellent recipes. Please use something with an EPA registration number. And with that, I will turn it back to Rhoda. Thanks, Amanda. And a word of warning, some of the uh, common uh, plants that we eat can be harmful to our pets, so we need to be cautious about that as well. Uh, with that, um, Laura, you want to update us on what's going on? We've been all over the board out here in Rapid City. We've been up to about 100, and now we're having a very nice 70-ish days. 
Yeah, sure. I'll do what I can. You know, the last time I visited with you all um, was after the derecho, which is May 12th. Um, and before the last time we froze. Um, so if you remember, Christine Lang and I both kind of hit that message hard um, that we had a, a really late frost at that time forecasted and it happened on May 21st and 22nd. And so that was certainly something we've seen um, since the last time I visited with you. Um, we've had quite a bit of severe weather um, that Amanda just remember, <laughs> reminded me about. Um, certainly severe thunderstorm winds. Um, you know, we've seen a lot of, lot of wind coming across, you know, even last night in Eastern South Dakota, Central and Eastern, um, we saw some really um, high wind speeds, I think in excess of 80 miles an hour in the Sioux Falls area. Um, and severe weather in general. Um, so far, uh, a preliminary count, we've had about 20 tornadoes in South Dakota. Our annual average is 30. Um, so we're far, we're, we're ahead of average uh, for this time of year. We're just kind of now getting to what's what's typically our peak severe weather season. So um, certainly continue to keep your eyes and ears open. Um, use those weather radios if you have it. Um, you know, keep your alerts open on your cell phone, your TV, your radio, what have you. Um, and they will they will keep you alert when when weather's happening. Um, I've also been pretty busy. This is the only kind of picture I, I was putting my slides together earlier today, and I'm like, oh, you, you all you guys show some great pictures. Uh, this is my home garden that I put in um, just since I last visited with you. So this is probably the week before Memorial Day. Um, so I do no-till garden here. Um, and I've had this in place, oh, about seven years now. And um, behind where I'm taking the picture, I have um, some apple trees, but just ignore the dandelions there. I'm not really good at the, the lawn stuff. <laughs> I really focus on the vegetable stuff, but um, it looks better now. This was actually, you know, a few weeks ago before Memorial Day weekend when we had, oh, six inches of rain um, at our place. So um, things are really perking up. And with the warm temperatures, everything is is really going bananas, which is good to see. Really good to see. So, just want to show you a picture of something um, uh, garden related. Um, frost date. So I mentioned May twenty first, twenty second was our last frost date. Um, that's what this map shows you here. Basically, the late the the last thirty two degree freeze date um, of the spring so far and. The yellows are that last 10 days of April. Um, the, let's see, the blues are, I need to move my thing here, um, the first 10 days in June. So we had a couple locations do that, um, which isn't too uncommon in the Black Hills to have a later frost date than the rest of us. Um, but most people you see in that kind of teal aqua color, that's the last 10 days of May, which would have been the 21st and 22nd. So this is in now climatologically um, the last, like the, the top 10%, um, 10th percentile of frost date. So really quite late um, for, for around here. Uh, since then though, over the last 30 days, um, here's, um, our average temperature compared to normal for the last 30 days. Um, and you see kind of a mixed bag of colors here. Uh, we actually were, were continuing um, pretty cool there for a while. Um, but then recently, of course, we've been very hot, um, you know, 15, 20 degrees above average last you know, weekend. Um, so the average temperature is kind of, you know, kind of masking some of those extremes. Um, but you can tell, you know, anything in the greens and blues um, have been cooler than average um, for the last 30 days. The oranges, yellows, oranges, uh, warmer than average for the last 30 days. Um, and I'm talking to you from Brookings today um, in my office on campus, and I'm looking at that red dot <laughs> at Brookings, and I looked at the data and it looks right. So. I don't know what, what this weird anomaly is here in Brookings, but something really, really warm in the data. Maybe there's a bad number uh, somewhere somewhere earlier. Um, 
but you can kind of pick out where you are and, and see um, where you've been relative to normal. Um, precipitation. Um, this is just total rainfall, not as compared to average or anything like that over the last four weeks. Um, so since that, that Monday before Memorial Day. So this includes um, that really wet weekend um, that we had up in Brown County. Um, and this is using Kokoraz. And I think I've talked with you about Kokoraz before. It's a great, great um, way to track your precipitation, um, especially for, for gardeners. Um, I, I'm a member of this, I'm the state coordinator as well. Um, and it's really great to, to really see what we're getting. Um, even just this morning, I had an inch four um, rain in my gauge and my in-laws that live just three miles to the north of us as a crow flies, she only had like two thirds of an inch. So it's really catches that variability. Um, but anyways, here's where we see um, a, a lot of that rainfall. You know, average rainfall this time of year is um, probably about three and a half inches for the month, a little more in the north, in the southeast, a little less in the northwest. Um, you know, I'll say three to four inches is the monthly average for, for June. So um, you can kind of get an idea here. When you're looking at the dark blues, that's about three and a third to five and a third. So um, that would be something above average in that navy blue color there and anything in the green too. So we're really getting, catching some good rains um, in the last four weeks. And, you know, I've talked about drought. I know the Northeastern corner of the state has really been wet <laughs> um, and, and no doubt about that. I know that's caused a lot of challenges for farming in particular in lakes and, and waterways and those kinds of things. But the recent rains have eased the drought situation as well, which is really great. Um, this is the current map according to the U.S. Drought Monitor um, showing areas of drought and how severe it is. Um, so the tan color is what we would consider drought, moderate drought uh, D1. Um, the orange is D2. Um, D1 drought is, you know, probably about every five year frequency, something like that um, for this time of year. Um, D2 is something maybe you'll see um, maybe every 10 years, every 10 or 20 years, something like that, to put you in perspective. Um, we're also looking at the southeast corner, which I think is really holding on to drought. Um, they've really missed a lot of rain. I know in that Centerville, Beersford area, down into that corner with Iowa. So that'd be, you know, Clay, Union County, I know is still struggling, trying to catch some rains down there. That's one area that hasn't changed much on the drought monitor. Um, this map shows what areas have changed and the light green is one category improvement over the last four weeks. The darker green has shown two category improvements um, in the last four weeks according to the drought monitor. So um, we haven't had any areas degrade or get worse. Um, some areas holding steady, but we've seen quite a bit of improvement again with the rains that have been um, near to above average, actually above average in a lot of areas, kind of shrinking that down finally. As we look out ahead, um, here's the next seven days precipitation, really um, pretty dry for the West. Um, you see some white areas, which is zero rainfall expected in the next week. So um, especially given some of the warm temperatures, we're gonna see some highs in the 90s again um, on Thursday you know, get that watering system back in action. Um, if you haven't been, been watering much, um, I know probably you have, but um, out west, uh, south central looks a bit drier. Up in the northeast, um, see a little better chances of some rain there, again, later, later this week, probably around Thursday, Friday. As we look out ahead here, um, this is the new outlook that was just released on Thursday last week um, for the month of July. A um, little bit of a change um, for the summer than what we've seen previously. Um, they were really um, thinking, you know, that we would be more in the above average temperature category there on the left map. Um, but looks like areas North Dakota and, and up into Canada um, are are really showing more leaning towards cooler temperatures 
Um, so they've kind of backed off on, on our heat here in South Dakota, um, thinking we're kind of on that line between cooler than the north and wetter or warmer to the south. Um, do you see on the right though, the, the southern third of the state slightly uh, leaning towards more, or sorry, drier than average conditions? Um, so kind of putting that in combination with the drought monitor map I showed you a few slides ago, um, and with you know slight leaning towards warmer temperatures there in the Southwest, um, I don't know that drought's gonna go away in a real hurry. Um, I'm a little bit, you know, just keeping an eye on things as far as, you know, maybe drought redeveloping or re-intensifying. Um, you know, almost always in the summer, we see a week of really hot and dry conditions. Maybe we just saw that, um, but we just cross fingers and hope it doesn't happen like during a flowering stage or a pollination stage that can really hit um, our gardens and, and crops really hard. Um, looking out ahead, uh, July through September, kind of putting all three of those months together, um, we do see some enhanced chances or increased likelihood of warmer than average as we get deeper into that summer season. Um, that's what you see on the left there. And then on the right, um, looking, continuing to look at um, higher potential of drier than average also in that, in that three month period. So, um, you know, could see some warmer, drier conditions again as we get towards the towards the latter part of the season. Um, we uh, John threw in some information about growing degree days, and I don't, I, I didn't have a um, anything particular to say about growing degree days in general. Um, but there is this tool called the Corn Growing Degree Day tool, uh, where if you're growing sweet corn, um, for example, or corn and um, in the field, like a, a row crop, like agriculture side. This is a neat way to do it. It also, a neat way to show growing degree days. You can pick your county. Um, and if you're growing like field corn, you can pick what maturity day and stuff like that. But um, you can pick your planting date and then it'll start occurring um, this year's growing degree days for your county um, based on your plant date. Um, so th this is one example I ran for Brown County. Um, we had pretty late planting, so I put in May 24th as a planting date, and that's down here, um, starting in the green color, looking at my scale here, or my uh, legend here at green. Um, the purple line was the average, the 30-year average accumulated growing degree days for that time. And so we can see that we were kind of just near to below average. But the last few days here, um, the green line finally poked up above average. So we're catching up um, for lost time a little bit. Um, also for this corn growing degree day tool, um, it caps at 86 degrees. Um, so they kind of um, hone in on the established, you know, ideal growing range for corn. So 50 to 86 degrees. So if it's above 86 degrees, they, they, they cap it there. So they wouldn't take like the 100 degree days. Um, what's also kind of cool about this is it can predict based on where you are so far and look at climatology of how fast we accrue growing degree days. It'll estimate when we get to um, the silking layer, for example, which is the red bar, the red vertical bar. Um, and it gives a range with these dotted lines here, the, the range of dates um, that, that may occur based on historical data, um, historical temperature data, um, with the most likely date here in late July. And if this was the live website, it, you could click on it and show you the date. Similarly, um, you could pick out when you get to um, black layer, for example, which is something really for field corn, way mature. And then it, also throws in um, the blue bars, which are the freeze dates, the historical freeze dates with the tallest bar showing you the average freeze date. So you can kind of get a ballpark idea of, of when your, your corn is gonna reach these um, physiological stages. So I was kind of messing around. Um, I pulled a similar thing for Yankton. 
um, looking at their growing degree days. And I set an earlier plant date of May 1st. Um, also comparing to last year in the orange line, that's 2021, we're far, we're a little bit behind where we were last year this time. Um, and then I'm like, well, gosh, there should be, you know, some kind of tool to figure this out for like tomatoes and broccoli and all these other things. And sure enough, there is. Um, and so I have that link up here on the top right of this slide. And it's a little model you put in your location and you find a station nearby and you put in, you know, what vegetable or, or what it is you're growing. And so I ran it for like, you know, my big beef tomatoes or whatever they're called. And, um, and it estimated when I'll get fruit and all that kind of thing. So when it's going to be ready to harvest. And so that was kind of cool to see that kind of thing um, for some other vegetables, vegetable crops that you might be growing uh, in your garden. So um, maybe worth a try if you want to play around with some growing degree day data. It's really just temperature based that establishes different growth stages of your crop. Um, so with that, I'm trying to think there's anything else. I know we've had quite a bit of wind, quite a bit of storm damage out there. And I know John's on top of the tree issues. So um, I'll kind of leave that for him. Um, I am on Twitter and Facebook. If you guys um, are into the social media, I do share stuff there on occasion as well. Um, so I encourage you to follow me there too. I will stop sharing. And looks like there might be a few, couple questions or did they get hit uh, answered already? I think they got answered. Laura, I have one for you. Maybe maybe we're just optimistic, but it seems like we've had more wind out here in Rapid City than a normal year, but it started early and never gave up. Is that is that actually the case or are we just just more sensitive this year? Yeah, we did start off the year uh, really much windier than average, and April was probably the peak of that, um, that really windy season, but, you know, January through April um, was above average for wind, for sure. I think there was kind of a, a, a lull there in May, with the exception of the, the derecho um, day, but, um, yeah, now we're starting to see more severe weather and more wind come back again, um, and they kind of go hand in hand. Um, there, yeah, there's been quite a bit of, yeah, shingles and structure damage and yeah, and people after they're picking up with one, one windstorm, they're, they're getting another. So I, I know it's been a really big challenge. Um, hopefully you haven't had too much damage in your gardens yet. I know my stuff is still pretty small. Um, I did notice after the weekend, my tomatoes were kind of leaning to the north <laughs> after suffering that south wind so long. Um, but uh, things haven't gotten lodged or anything yet. You know, we're still pretty early, so. Well, thank you. Uh, and a reminder to our, to our listeners, if you have cool hail pictures of your plants, I'd love some, some uh, af right after damage and a week or two or three later, but even just plain uh, what happened is great. And, uh, those are the kinds of pictures that we can use in in talks and publications and so forth. And and uh, if you're like me, you never remember to do the camera when you should have. So <laughs> if those of you who are better at that than I am, uh, you can just email them to me or, or contact me and we can figure out how to get them transferred. So we've been talking a lot uh, tonight about uh, food products and uh, there we go. Um, I thought I'd pick on a little lesser known uh, fruit this, this week. Um, this is a great one for small yards, or if you've got quite a bit of shade, they can take a fair amount of shade, especially if it's like I used to grow mine under my honey locust tree and got pretty good fruit load off of it. So uh, currants are, and remember it's spelled with an A, not an E. Uh, 
currants are a great little option for home gardeners. Um, they like it, they like to be mulched pretty well. They don't like dry roots. Um, and they actually do use a fair amount of nitrogen per plant. So if, if your gets pretty good sunshine, gets good moisture, but it still seems to be not doing a whole lot, try giving a little bit of fertilizer or about the same as you might give your, your lawn. The one thing we do have to be aware of with all the currents is to watch out for white pine blister rust, which will hit any of the white pines or the five needle pines. If you have them in your neighborhood, uh, maybe a few blocks away or something, uh, you might want to make sure that whatever current you plant is resistant. And I've, I'm finding some conflicting information on that and perhaps John wants to jump in on that, but uh, red and white currants tend to be more resistant, um, but there are some black currants that are bred with fairly high resistance. So uh, with each cultivar, you, you just need to check it out if, if that's going to be an issue for you. Uh, we have white currants or, or these are called actually pink champagne. Um, Rovado is a really good red currant. Um, they come, tend to ripen all at once, so you can, can pick them all at once, which is kind of convenient. Uh, it also helps <laughs> so that you know when to uh, cover them up to keep them from the birds. Uh, the white ones, the birds aren't quite as quick to catch on to, but once they do catch on, they'll be gone as well. So uh, don't count on the white, keeping them from the birds. Black currants are uh, less tasty, probably for fresh eating, uh, but, and this is probably why, they have a lot of antioxidants, uh, twice that of, of blueberries, or at least of the commercial blueberries. Uh, they have twice the potassium that are in bananas. Of course, you eat quite a few black currants to get a banana's worth, but you can eat half as much and still have as much as the banana. Uh, five times more vitamin C than the equal amount of oranges. So they're, they're very healthy. And this is a commercial field in South Dakota, uh, Stewart Saronia. Acres. He also has some black currants, which he harvests with a with a machine harvest. Um, and I know of at least two other black currant commercial plantings in the state. So uh, just something of interest that that uh, you can also plant these in your yard. The red and white currants are self fruitful, so you don't have to worry about pollinator. But the black currants. Uh, do need two varieties to pollinate each other. And the black currants get a little larger. Uh, so you have to devote a little bit more space for them. Uh, so again, a different kind of fruit to consider for your yard. Uh, come into fruiting pr pretty quickly. A couple of years after planting, uh, you should start to have a, a pretty good crop. Another uh, possible food, and last week we talked about purslane. This week it's about lamb's quarter. Uh, and the, you can, I identify this partly by the shape of the leaf, but this white, whitish uh, cast to the new leaves is quite uh, distinctive once you see it and, and have it in your mind. Uh, you can get a pretty good idea of, of whether it's lamb's quarter or not, but be sure that you, uh, if you're not sure that you check it out, bring it to your extension office, send us a picture or something because we don't want you eating unknown uh, plants. But lamb's quarter, I actually prefer to spinach. I don't bother to plant spinach anymore because I eat lamb's quarter. Although this is, a, a warm season weed. So it's, if you want early season spinach, then you still have to plant it for the cool season. But but you can eat it raw or you can steam it like spinach, 
one thing to be aware of, this does have some oxalic acid in, and so if you have health problems that are uh, that are sensitive to oxalic acid, gout or something like that, um, you don't want to eat this. Although steaming it, cooking it, uh, will reduce the oxalic acid quite a bit. You want to you uh, pour off the water and, and uh, it tastes pretty much like a mild spinach, I think. I actually prefer the, the taste to the spinach. And in 100 grams, you have 43 calories and get vitamin C, 89% of your recommended daily amount, 64% uh, of your vitamin A, 34 of riboflavin, 16 of vitamin B6, and about a fourth of your calcium for the day. So an alternative green, eat your problems instead of uh, uh, worrying about them. And then finally, now I'd like to end by uh, saying, if you've been slow like I have been in being able to get out and get the garden planted, or if you need to replant, uh, some of the things that you can plant right now, beans, of course, we tend to plant those every couple of weeks for until early July or so. Uh, so you can plant them. Sweet corn, you may not have thought of, uh, you think, knee high by the 4th of July, you might have to do a shorter season variety, depending where in the state you are. A zucchini uh, comes up. That's one of the quickest ones to grow. It, it, that always surprises me for some reason, but uh, about 60 days for spinach. Uh, cucumbers, again, may depend on the variety. Uh, carrots are, can, can uh, withstand uh, those cooler uh, cooler temperatures in the fall has canned beets and then basil here does not sp does not like it under 40 degrees uh, but it grows quite quick quickly so you could still plant basil at this point and with that uh, I don't see any uh, questions unless anybody has a comment or if John wants to jump in about the currents. Sure, we only got about a minute. So I don't know about the rest of you. I grew up on cod liver oil. You know, if I'm looking for something else to eat, five guys is my choice, not lamb quarters. Anyway, <laughs> difference of opinion. But yeah, Rhoda, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of information often conflicting as to currants and white pines we don't have a lot of five needle pines in south dakota our weather pretty much takes care of that but we do have a native stand of limber pine in the black hills up in the cathedral spires and in 1991 uh, white pine blister rust finally reached it uh, so we have a lot of native currants i might mention as well as the ones you plant i guess just double check as best you can but uh, I hate to give any generalities there. I, I agree with you. It tends to be very much cultivar related. And what I was reading seemed to indicate that the native varieties tend to have quite a bit of resistance. Is that correct? Not in my experience. I okay. mean, literally, they are covered with it out in the uh, out in the spires area. Uh, well, that's I mean, good to know. Yeah. All right. Well, we thank you for attending tonight, for being with us, and uh, we thank our panelists, uh, John and Amanda and Laura, and we thank also our, our behind the scenes person, Evans, who without his help, this wouldn't take place at all. So we appreciate that. And we invite you to come back next week same time same place and uh, if you have questions in the meanwhile be sure to uh, email them to the garden hotline or give the garden hotline a call uh, the information is in the chat and thank you and have a good evening <laughs>